there's a very simple answer to that. <clears throat> um, from the case, you, you mentioned that the case is dated from 1959. You're absolutely correct. Now, in 1959, the reporting of concerns or known abuses of children um, was an entirely discretionary matter because there was no law requiring anyone within a school or other institutional setting, there was no requirement on them to report any known or actual abuse to anybody. In 1960, well, in, in, in the 1960s when I was abused, it was the same. And today, it remains the same. And we constantly hear, um, particularly from the school sector, particularly the independent school sector, that everything has changed. Well, look, I concur. The carpets and the curtains have changed, but the law hasn't. And it is still entirely discretionary as to whether any allegation is reported. And when you're talking about a fee-receiving institution, such as I attended, so in other words, a private school, um, there is an immediate conflict of interest. As a result of there being no law requiring anyone to report anything, the school requiring to report, a teacher within the school required, being required to report it up to their boss, the headmaster, very simply, as a result of it all being discretionary, um, it presents these institutions with a conflict of interest because either they're going to report the worst bit of news that the school could possibly inflict upon itself or they're going to defend their balance sheet and reputation. Well, I mean, what you're, what you're implying or stating quite firmly is because of a lack of a firm legal ruling on this, it is not in a school's interest to uh, let any of these cases come to court or come to public uh, revelation, uh, except in the most extreme cases, because it's bad for business. You've got it in one. And in fact, um, you may recall that very recently in a current affairs programme on BBC... Um, Keir Starmer, the former DPP, three days after he'd stepped down from the job, he'd been in the job for uh, the full duration, um, um, uh, appeared in this current affairs program and said, you know, it is time for change in these institutions. These institutions are called regulated activities. They're defined as regulated activities by, you know, what is technically called the, the Safeguarding Vulnerable Groups Act 2006. And he said, look, these institutions, these hierarchical structures... They have got to have the, um, uh, the spine of law, because without them, you cannot deliver a functioning, credible child protection system. It's simply not possible, because it's not in the school's interest. To and presumably, you wouldn't say that uh, this can be achieved by tightening up the rules on what headmasters do, because in your own case, uh, it's very often, it was the headmaster who was the abuser. Uh, and actually, you know, uh, that's absolutely correct. And there is another uh, sort of very famous case that happened in um, 2012. Um, and this actually didn't involve um, a, a fee-paying institution. This was a school called Hillside First School in Western Supermare, which was um, a local authority school. A serious case review report was produced. Uh, Nigel Leet, um, the teacher who was abusing um, uh, 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 was um, sentenced and imprisoned. And in very simple terms, um, 30 incidences of concerns were noted by staff. Only 11 of those 30 were reported up to the headmaster. The headmaster reported none to the local authority. As a result, Mr. Leet carried on abusing for 13 years. There's a perfect example. Not to excuse or condone that uh, type of abuse or behaviour in any way, of course, but I suppose some people would argue that we live uh, in Britain in a very different climate socially now, and they would imagine, presumably because they've not been, been touched by this, they would imagine that it is much harder for this type of sexual abuse to be covered up within a school uh, setup. That, that, that the schools have taken some measures to, for example, monitor how often pupils are allowed to be alone with uh, other, you know, members of staff, that kind of thing. Do you think there are any safeguards in place that would satisfy you? Um, well, that is a, that's, that last part of the question is quite an interesting way you put it. Let me just turn it round the other way, if I may. Um, and to put it in a slightly more realistic basis, um, 
there is fundamentally within any school, um, uh, uh, in order for it to be covered up, abuse has to be discovered. And that's the principal problem. It has to be discovered in order for it to be covered up. Discovering abuse is the most difficult thing in the world because this is a unique crime. Because you have a perpetrator and a victim. And this is the only crime, as far as I know, where the perpetrator is as keen as the victim to keep it a secret. When you're dealing with that kind of crime, I'm afraid you have a very big problem. Then add to that, when it eventually does come out, it's in the interests of the school to conceal it. Um, quite often, especially if it's a fee-receiving institution, and I'm afraid you have a big problem. If, however, you say, if you do conceal it, and if you do conceal your known concerns, okay, um, concerns or um, uh, known incidences of abuse, you will face a prison sentence for not reporting. Guess what happens? The report is made. It makes life easier for staff. It was said to me by um, a director at the DFE, um, the Department for Education, when I met them in October, oh, you're just trying to criminalize staff. Well, why would anybody want to do that? Law influences behavior. That's what it does. Um, you know, I asked this gentleman whether, you know, on his way to the supermarket, if he felt criminalized. I mean, he could get criminalized for about 20-odd offenses just going to the supermarket, anything from not wearing a seatbelt to drink driving, driving recklessly, do you feel criminalized? The answer is no. The law influences behavior, and that's what you need in order to have credible child protection um, uh, in these settings. So, your, I mean, your solution to this, Mr. Perry, would be to make it clear to head teachers, headmasters, whatever you like to call them, that if abuse has occurred at their school and they have any whiff of it and they don't do something about reporting that to the law, they themselves become culpable and will face a jail term. Absolutely, but it's not just the headmasters, it's the staff as well, you see, because very simply, I mean, if, you, if we take just one example, I mean, uh, uh, hospitals are also regulated activities. And we all heard that, you know, Mr. Saville, when he was working at Stoke Mandeville, we understand the behaviors he got up to. We're, we're still awaiting the report to be produced. But one of the things that came out very clearly and has been reported in, on many occasions is that, is that nurses were telling children to pretend to be asleep if he comes around. Now, what was it that the nurses saw, heard, okay, that prompted them to tell children to pretend to be asleep if he comes around? And why wasn't that behavior reported? So it starts at the bottom. It starts, you know, at the point of delivery. So it is the teachers, the junior teachers, the ground staff. It's everybody. And they should report up to the head. The head, and they must do that in law. The head then, or, and the chairman of the Board of Governors, must then report it out. They must do that by the law. When you get that culture in place, or when you get that law in place, you change culture. It's a catalyst for culture change towards child protection. At the moment, it's something which is on the back of the stove. And that's the problem. It's an afterthought. Get 100 parents together and say, how many of you have read the child protection policy of this school? And if you get one hand going up, I'd be surprised. Nobody if, has. If such a system had been in place when you were a schoolboy, would it have prevented you being abused? Unquestionably, because, um, uh, unquestionably, and let me explain why. I um, remember my hero at school, who was the captain of rugby. I was a sportsman. I was captain of rugby myself, eventually. But I saw this man who was my hero regularly. When this master, Mr. Wright, who's going to be convicted or sentenced tomorrow, when he didn't turn up at breakfast, which everyone was meant to do by default, that was the, that was the rule, and he seemed to be able to flout it with impunity, um, it then befell the captain of rugby to take tea to the to this man's dressing room, uh, to this man's uh, bedroom. Sorry, and frequently, this boy did not return. Now that was seen by all other members of staff. Now I knew this to be odd, because I knew that members of staff had to be at breakfast, and all I thought, because I my innocent mind couldn't go where. Um, uh, couldn't go anywhere near there being sexual abuse. It was just, you know, that wasn't even on my horizons. I had no clue what sex was all about. No clue at all. I was too busy playing sport and enjoying life. 
But I saw this, and I thought, well, if I become captain of rugby, that's what I'm going to have to do. And I did. Now, why didn't anybody report that? Silence. And during those sessions of taking tea to a room, abuse was perpetrated on me. And the man who was my hero is also in the trial, and abuse was perpetrated on him. So this is a, a, a vicious uh, circle of abuse which repeats itself uh, down through the generations. Yep. And very simply, nothing is going to change. No matter the platitudes that are trolled out by um, um, schools and other institutions, it's not just down to schools, no matter what is said, you cannot have a functioning child protection system without the spine of law. It's not possible. Do you think... And very simply, I actually feel very sorry for schools. I believe they want to do the right thing. Far too many temptations get in the way of not doing the right thing. And I think they're being given an impossible task to deliver by a department of government, namely the Department for Education, which rather sadly is responsible for child protection, when in my opinion it should be the Department of Health. This is a health issue. It is not an education matter. It's health. Given the, the level of attention that's been focused on sexual yep. abuse of all kinds in the last, well, I would say, couple of years only in the media it, with yep. cases such as your own, given the focus on that, are, are the authorities not now primed to do whatever it takes and listen to people like yourselves as never before? Oh, no, absolutely not. No, no. Um, they have rejected mandatory reporting outright. The evidence that they've produced to justify their positions is, um, I have to say, pretty light. And um, the research that is being, has been put before us is, is quite odd. It's, it's pretty polemic. And um, how, I, how do you explain that? Something that people get so riled up about and seem to pretty much universally condemn as wrong. How can they not act on cases such as your own and listen to what you have to say? Uh, the government really, I don't think, is interested in listening. Um, Mr. Gove doesn't have a good ear, um, and he's the minister responsible. Um, and that's regrettable, because actually what we have to say, I think, is positive. The concerns that Mr. Gove has is the system will be swamped. Um, will be swamped with both um, valid claims and false claims. Um, but ironically, the, um, the research from the Department of Education DfE 194 paper um, indicates that false claims, false and malicious claims, account for 2% of all reports made to the LADO. Now, that's 2% too many. But um, um, uh, what we have is, is a government that is terrified, and successive governments, it's not particularly this one, it's cross-party, um, who are terrified of being swamped and overloading social services, overloading the police child abuse investigation units, overloading the courts and overloading the prisons. So it's a cost issue. It's nothing to do with child protection, in my opinion. And I've actually put that to somebody at the Department for Education, who I have to say did get rather aerated at that suggestion. But bearing in mind that I have a letter on my desk from Mr. Gove via my MP that mentions the word swamping, quite clearly there is more than something in the assertion that I'm suggesting to so you. So it's child abuse and sexual abuse of people at schools, particularly private institutions, you're suggesting is too big a problem to confront. Too big a, child abuse, period, is too big a problem to confront. Um, and, and private schools are just one part of that, because private schools only account for 6% of pupils educated in this country. So as a percentage, it's quite small. There is far more abuse happening in, 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 in state schools, just purely because of the, the, the numeric differentiation. But in private schools, there is a different dynamic because um, they're defending reputation. And that very same defense of reputation is going to become much more uh, pronounced because of the current government's policy of academies, free schools, and trusts, which are quasi-independent settings. So in other words, they are independent of the local authority. They can make their own decisions. They're funded, of course, yes, but they make their decisions on how they use their own funding. 
Um, principally, I have no problem with that. But what concerns me is, is that those schools being separated from the local authority and under no local authority control makes them effectively quasi-private institutions. And so I believe, and, you know, I mean, this is purely speculative, this particular point. I, I, there is a very strong likelihood that we're going to get the same sort of propensity to conceal bad news because these, these, these quasi-independent institutions um, uh, are going to be very dependent on their success as a result of their reputation. And you see them as potential breeding grounds for the abuse of children? I think it's a petri dish.